The Wagner plan is central to Wagner's identity. It's also an elegant plan which predated a lot of reforms in other places. In we were an exemplar for other colleges and universities. So Richard Garassi drafted an idea for the Wagner plan. He was hired in early spring of 97 and he gave this draft to the faculty and this was the basis that he and the faculty working together developed into the Wagner plan. And the Wagner plan is three learning communities, freshman, intermediate, and senior. The idea is that the first two are interdisciplinary. So you have two faculties from two different disciplines. It is a community. The same students take both of those classes. And there is an RFT where the students write about those two classes and how they relate to an experiential component that they do in the community. This program is, is essential to, to my career as a professor and as a researcher because it allows me to think outside of my own discipline. It allows me to learn a great deal from my colleagues, and that is exceptional. In many, many of the years that, we, that I taught this class, I, I sent my students, I didn't go with them, um, to take the number seven train out to Flushing and to uh, experiment uh, eating different kinds of foods that they found and then to write about it. And that, that has been uh, a, a really interesting thing to watch students talk about when they got back, right? It was a real uh, introduction, I think, to some, to some of the real wonders of the city. One of my most memorable learning community experiences was going to the archives in New York City. Since I'm a history major, uh, my professor took us to the archives and they had amazing first uh, primary sources for us to look at from the time period that we were studying for our papers, our research papers. And so being able to look at sources that were from the 1800s and even before then was incredible. As a historian, it was my first experience in the archives. Biggest element of enjoyment was learning from that professor and just listening and, and, and being able to observe my colleague instead of just me being the protagonist. And those moments in which we would just finish the sentences, you know, I would start a sentence and the other professor would end the sentence. I mean, that, that type of, of intersection and compatibility was really, has been amazing. I did also co-taught a class, uh, an Expanding Your Horizons class, which was an intermediate learning community uh, with Dr. Philip Catelli. We took students to Cuba, and that was also an amazing experience, and just continuing my fascination for, for films and how to analyze films and, and, and just see how this interdisciplinarity aspect becomes. Magic. I teach with Celeste Gagnon in anthropology and it's a course that's based on food and so she kind of goes over the domestication of different foods and the cultural reasons why we eat the way we eat and then I cover the important food molecules, the chemical processes that happen during cooking and we kind of pair those two together in one team taught class. It's having you know two different faculty members in the same room teaching from different disciplines on one common topic I find really interesting and I think it's really uh, interesting for the students to kind of see how uh, the relationship between two things that they didn't necessarily think were related or you know maybe they're not super interested in one of the disciplines and they kind of find that it can be enjoyable. Uh, it's really really nice to see and develop as the semester progresses. I, I also I took abroad so I went abroad to Arezzo, Italy which is a small city in between Florence and Rome. I was basically doing physical theater at this Italian conservatory, something that we don't usually do around here at Wagner, but I was able to apply what I've learned thus far at Wagner into like a totally new environment. I was on the acting side and acting for the camera class, so it was a little bit of a flip-flop from what I normally do, and then it was even acting with people that didn't have a lot of acting experience themselves, or working with people who had done just a little bit of filmmaking wanted to forward that. So it was a fun little change up on all fronts. Really. The most memorable experience was doing 
an exhibit in like the library. So basically it was like the history of Wagner College was the whole thing. We got to pick something we wanted, a topic we felt strongly about. So I chose black history and I got to like go in the archives of Wagner College and like see what I could find about it. And then we got to put it up in an art exhibit. And it was really cool. I printed out this like super long poster of a picture of all the black BSU students from the 1970s on the roof of Cunard Hall. They held an occupation of Cunard Hall as like a civil rights movement protest here on campus. So I printed out the picture and it was this huge poster in the library and the exhibit. So I was super excited about it. It was a great time. <laughs> Many times with a uh, professor in the psychology department, we were investigating the history of food and eating behavior from the perspective of psychology and the perspective of history. The methodology of those two disciplines were complementary, but it, but we really didn't understand how the other discipline sort of arrived at the conclusions that they did. And so our students would watch us disagree. <laughs> And a lot of them really thought that was fun and actually quite exciting. Well, I was in LC 13. I had anatomy and I had medical ethics. Part of our LC where we went to the JCC as like, I guess like the trip and like it, we had to get like credits for it. And we went and helped out like seniors and whatnot. And so we got to like get to know them and like we played games with them and whatnot. So it was like cute and wholesome. I started Wagner wanting to be a zookeeper. I love zoos, I love animals, I still do. I don't think I would be in the position I am today if it wasn't for Wagner College and the Wagner plan and all of the way. It immediately brings students into the fold and into the academic environment and helps them build a support network to be successful. Lori Weintraub and I, when we did our LC, we brought students into PS57, which is located on Staten Island, is largely um, a minority school with many, many, many students um, whose, parent, whose parents are, are first generation Americans. Um, that was really eye-opening. Um, one of the things was to learn how little arts education there was going on in the elementary school. I think at the time we were the only program. It was really fulfilling and our students worked with the students there and got the experience of kind of getting the chance to teach um, rather than just being students. I would say the value of a Wagner College learning community is meeting friends immediately and also understanding that the professors who are in your first year learning community are going to know you on a, a more personal level than any professor would at any other university your freshman year. The Wagner plan has energized the faculty intellectually. ILCs can kind of like bridge two possibly like very different groups of people together, at least in terms of what they're learning. And that's really cool. I know I would be a performance major, so like I wouldn't normally meet like a psych major or like a nursing major or something like that just like in my classes on day to day so I think it's really helpful in like helping branch out and meet new people on campus. So no matter what you do in your life you will always have to think outside of the box and I think that the Wagner plan is training students to think outside of the box. It allows students to kind of explore a, a wide breadth of things, subjects, areas in their education in, in kind of a structured way. It allows you to work outside of a space or forward a space that you're interested in. It shows students that everything has an intersection. Every discipline can intersect with other disciplines. Frankly, I think it's the best way to transition into college, and I think it's the best way to wrap up your college experience. Today, even though 25 years later, a lot of schools have implemented different elements that we have in our Wagner plan, I'm a single, single one that combines all the elements so elegantly. One, I, I, it's hard to follow a video like that, but let me try. And, and I'm really here to introduce Richard Garassi, who will then introduce everyone else. So what I thought I'd do is, is tell you a little bit about many of you who are in the room, 
if you have either been a student here going back a few years or certainly for our faculty and staff, remember Rich Grassi, president of Wagner College. But if we talk about the Wagner plan, I just want to say a couple words about Richard Grassi, the provost. And he started talking to me about this idea and he talked a lot about the things, the reason he came to Wagner, I think I might have even asked you, why'd you come to Wagner? And you know, he, he always likes to tell the story about how he says, look out the window, right? In New York City. And, but he also talked about how Wagner was different than the other small liberal arts colleges he had been at, and also some of the ones he had interviewed at when he was coming, when he was thinking about coming to Wagner, in that we had these professional programs and these traditional arts and science programs on the same small college campus, and then on top of that, we were in New York City. And he said, and we're gonna meld all that together, and we're going to put that into, co you're, he's, he always used to say, you're, always, you're already doing this, but we're gonna make it coherent and into a plan. And I said, okay, that sounds good. And over the summer, he started working with faculty during the summer, right, because he came in July. And I remember the meeting we had, I don't know if you remember, but it was right after Labor Day, that's in my head anyway, it could have been a little earlier, but it was after the semester started, he'd been here two months, and he said, okay, I'd like to be with your admission staff because I wanna know if you can sell this. And he explained this program that he was gonna work on with the faculty, and it was going to be a four-year program. Every student had to go through it, basically what you now know as the Wagner Plan. And I said, yeah, sure, I, we could sell that. What are you talking about, two years from now, three years from now? He goes, no, I need you guys on the road now because it's going to be implemented next September. And through all that, right, it was just, we always, the one thing Richard always talked about, and this is important to consider today, on the 25th anniversary as we look to the future, and I know you're going to say some of this, right? but he always talked about it as an architecture, not a blueprint. So I just mentioned that last point to say things are cyclical. And I think we always have to be thinking about what we need now and what we'll need five years from now and the fact that things do change. And I think that's a lesson that I learned from you, Richard, and so I'm grateful for that. And I think we should always keep it in mind. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Richard Garassi. Karen Garassi wanted to be here tonight. She just got back from a trip abroad and came down ill, so she can't. She's been texting me. I wish I was there and meeting everybody. So it's great to see everyone. And uh, but the place is still such a very, very special place. I won't be long. Um, I just want to say a few words to set the stage, and then we're gonna have this fabulous panel who really have lots to say about how the plan really affected their lives and created a foundation for themselves. So uh, in 1997, the document that John Messer held up in the video, I just want to read you two sentences, see if this sounds familiar. And this is what we wrote in 1997 in March. Uh, it's, it was called the New Liberal Arts. Private liberal education is under severe public scrutiny by a skeptical public, unsure of its value, unclear about its purposes, unable to define it, and clearly alienated from its excessive cost. Okay. Then the last sentence of this first paragraph was, they, the public, seek an educational model that offers its graduates a greater degree of both worldliness and knowledge, as well as the skills to negotiate lives filled with personal ambiguity, social diversity, and technological sophistication. So that was 1997. Sounds pretty, pretty close to today. <laughs> uh, we passed a document, which you probably can get in the library, called the Wagner Plan. It was really kind of an interesting document. But here's, the, here's what I want to say, three things. One, the center of universities and colleges is learning. That's what propels students. And most importantly, it's what propels faculty members and staff and support staff as well. It's learning. It's that un insatiable, insatiable desire to learn and grow. And I always would tell faculty, I tell my own daughter, who's a faculty, tenure faculty member herself, keep learning at the forefront, because that's why you went into this. That's why you're on a campus. So when I came in 1997, I was excited by two things. One, I met a lot of faculty members who were in the midst of a tough, difficult time at Wagner financially in every other way. And I saw an incredibly creative group, and I said, you know, I had opportunities at other places that come from elite schools. I said, this is the group I want to work with. They have incredible creativity. They don't know how good they are. And if we can structure a curriculum in a way that makes sense, they can unleash all of this creativity. 
So secondly, I also felt, as Angela mentioned, and this was on my mind, and one of the reasons why I chose to come to Wagner, I had been at traditionally private liberal arts colleges, which were no business school, no nursing school, nothing in the professions. I wanted to be at a place that reconciled liberal arts and professional education, because I believed firmly myself that the best way to learn was the combination of those two together. Okay? The liberal arts gives you the breadth and depth of the human experience, the engagement with the natural world. Right? It gives you all of that, um, as we would say, it's artes liberales is not liberal, as we know, not liberal or conservative education. It's liberating yourself, from the ancient Greek, from simply being a prisoner of what you've experienced yourself. To be liberally educated is to be brought, to, be, to see the whole cosmos, to be cosmopolitan. That's what a liberal education offers you, that tremendous breadth. And of course, professional education gives you applied learning. How do I take some of the things I'm engaged with into a real world setting and actually practice them and realize that what I'm learning is not quite fit to the grid of what's happening on the ground in front of me? How do I learn the interpretive skills? I'm going to take the breadth of what I'm learning, the, the expertise in my discipline, and apply it in a way with ethics and integrity and with experience and knowledge. So all of that to say, that was the preference for the following. We needed to reconcile professional education and the liberal arts. And what we created, the faculty created, was not a curriculum. We created an architecture for a curriculum. The faculty built the curriculum by the way they put their disciplines together around the themes they chose uh, in terms of the learning communities. And it was called, I'm, I'm sad that I don't see this at the bottom of the hill anymore, it's the one thing I'm sad about, is it was called the Wagner Plan for the Practical Liberal Arts for the practical liberal arts, because I wanted to define us as an institution that had the best of all these different ways of knowing and learning and engaging in the world. So that's what we did. It was an, an amazing group of people. I know there's an exhibition that I haven't seen yet over in the atrium, and you'll see some of these people you won't recognize, but that's what we all look like. In <laughs> so with that, thank you so much. I'm going to sit down. So you're going to introduce? Oh, yeah. There is a microphone around. See, this is the person I report to right now. <laughs> Margarita Sanchez. Get out of her way. <laughs> I miss the fact. We have a lot of fun with the uh, So, first we have Sandra, Mikala, and she, her. And you're going to talk a bit about your uh, your Wagner experience, but also your career and how it's all giving the foundation for going forward. So, you're on. I think, I think you can use that. I think no, it's not, not working. working. <laughs> yeah. 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 But you spoke last Technology um, hasn't changed. So. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know how I can follow it up. Hopefully I hit all the points that you spoke about in the Wagner plan. I think I did. But um, I'm Sandra. I graduated in 2015. I have a degree in chemistry here. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about you know, the Wagner plan and just the value of the interdisciplinary education that I got here. Can everybody hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. Uh, so in the seven minutes that uh, I have, I'm going to talk about my experience with the Wagner Plan while I was here and then how it has affected me both academically and in my uh, professional career. So um, I, my, one of my professors is here, my favorite professor. Uh, so the first year learning community was a wonderful class that was led by uh, Professor Gagnon here. Uh, I took anthropology with her um, and psychology with Dr. Uh, Jenkins. And you might remember this picture here. Um, we were sent out into the community to find this one restaurant. Um, and I found it, so there is evidence that it worked. Um, so, and you know, just to echo what Dr. Rossi was saying, um, this interdisciplinary approach to anthropology and psychology really did help me question um, and understand my relationship with myself, with others, um, the built environment. We had a project that Dr. Anyon designed where we went to different neighborhoods in New York City and we had a limited budget to find nutritious food. And uh, it was really uh, important for us, I think, as students to understand that the built environment or the neighborhoods that we live in really do uh, affect our health and our nutrition and it just helped us be aware of the disparities that exist in our city. Um, so this widened our lens of view of the world, not only of ourselves, but of the world. And um, the importance of field work was really key here because being out in the city 
uh, and doing this with our own, you know, we had to go to like different restaurants and, you know, see how much food was. And um, it was really, really important to uh, my understanding of myself in the world. Um, and even though I wanted to major in anthropology really badly, I fell in love with chemistry after having uh, <laughs> Gen Chem with Dr. Richardson there. Uh, and so for the intermediate learning community, I had organic chemistry and speech, which is not a likely pairing. Uh, <laughs> so it was an interesting uh, ILC. But ultimately, I think this taught us, it was the first time they were doing this ILC, uh, the professors, and it really just integrated my major um, with the rest of my learning. Um, and it was really key here because it was, we got to see the collaboration between faculty and students. So. I think that's a key aspect about our time here at Wagner, that we do get to have such close personal relationships with our professors and really teach one another. So we're not only learning from them, but we're uh, you know, teaching them um, about what we need and you know, the world that we're in. Uh, and so this was uh, us learning, but also applying real world skills. So one of our, it was a speech class, so we had to propose our ultimate ILC proposal for how we would want the class to run. Um, and I pulled a slide from this deck because I thought it was interesting, but the things that we as students wanted were, you know, talking about research careers, talking about careers that incorporate public speaking, showcasing our informative and persuasive skills, and interacting with larger audiences, mixed audience, interdisciplinary audiences, and just gaining professional experience. And I think we did that um, in this ILC. So moving on was a senior reflective tutorial. So for, it was all chemistry based this time. And like I worked with Dr. Richardson and Dr. Alauddin, it was great. Um, I, this was my capstone project. I worked on a Melinda and Bill Gates Foundation project with Dr. Alauddin, uh, looking at uh, urine samples with uh, in children in Uganda and, and abroad. Um, and so, but this experience for me really focused our work. So I was very focused in chemistry, but it gave me the time to reflect, like you said, reflect on everything that I learned, reflect on this integrated worldview that I had, the skills that I had learned, and really synthesizing and applying those skills um, to my own personal goals. So I kind of integrated the love for anthropology of my view of all the of my place in the world, my love for the sciences, and um, how I wanted to work in public health and share that information. So all of it kind of came together with this capstone project that was really based on um, improving health outcomes for babies uh, abroad. So that was a really wonderful experience. And what I do want to point out is that outside of the learning communities, Wagner as a whole with the liberal arts education part, there were so many learning experiences outside of just the learning communities curriculum. So outside of those learning communities, I published a paper uh, from Dr. Uh, Marowitz's class. And it's called, when I read this, I, I laugh to myself because I'm like, wow, I really, it's a completely <laughs> different discipline. So it was called an analysis of the influence of Christianity and French naturalism on Vincent van Gogh's relationships with and depictions of women. And I mean, go me. Uh, I was a chemistry major. <laughs> and, you know, I published in the uh, Wagner College Forum for Undergraduate Research under a completely different discipline. And that just goes to show how, you know, the breadth of, of education that we do receive here. Um, Another thing, you know, I presented research at the academic conferences like the rest of the science students. Here's a bunch of us at, um, I think we were in Ni Niagara or so we were somewhere, but this was one of the conferences I went to. I had real world training with Dr. Alauddin. I went and I trained at the Mayo Clinic. There I am really excited to be sampling with a pipette. Um, always very excitable. <laughs> I got to do global field work. I got to go to Bangladesh. I got to look at samples. I got to look at our global community and the impact that you know our world has on you know the industrialization and different things that go on in the world and how it has an impact on real people. So I got to uh, do global field work and um, the ex it, you know Dr. Laden is an amazing uh, contributor to just you know he's he's an incredible professor. I, I don't think he's here, but. Um, he got a Fulbright scholarship, so I was in charge of his lab, uh, which was a wonderful experience for me too, because I was running samples and I was training high school students and undergrads and you know, kind of making sure that our samples ran. And uh, I was able to do all of that because I had this training and this breadth of work and critical thinking and applied skills to be able to do something like that. Um, so 
basically what I'm trying to say is that the Wagner plan is inter integrative in, in every sense. You know, it was not only about my own perspective of my relationship to the world and then how I could tie all of that together to follow my dreams. So I'll talk a little bit about myself. So after graduating, how has that impacted me? Uh, so here I am with my chemistry cap. Um, I had done this global work. I had done this local work in the community. I presented. I'd shared my stuff. I'd done lab. I'd done. I'd done a lot of things. And I thought to myself, well, what do I do with this? Like, what am I going to do with uh, all of this? And so I thought PhD in chemistry. Everybody wanted me to do one of those, right? It made sense. <laughs> Dr. Richardson really wanted me to do that. Um, so I, and I and I tried, but I felt like it was removed from what I like to do, which was be with people. And so then I thought PhD in toxicology, right? That's more applied, that makes sense. I did one year and I did not enjoy killing mice. So I said, forget it, I wanna work with people. <laughs> and so I switched and I followed what I had wanted to do all along, which was work in public health. And so today, uh, with all the things that I learned uh, at Wagner, I work at the Columbia University Medical Center. I coordinate research there. Um, I just started a master's in nutrition last year, so I work full-time and go to school part-time, it's a lot. And uh, the work that we do is tied to this organization called Hip Hop Public Health, where basically all of the things that I learned are tied in together. We uh, work with vulnerable communities and we bring in, this is a clinical trial that we just wrapped up, um, and we design curriculum with hip hop music. Oh. I didn't know it was gonna play. But <laughs> these are the students that we work with. So we designed a curriculum um, empowering youth in underserved communities to be champions of their own health through the power of hip hop. So all of the things that I learned here, all of the skills, uh, I lead a team at Wagner. I have a PI above me, but I lead our team and I go into our community here in New York City and we teach kids about uh, health topics. This one is about Alzheimer's. We've done stroke um, and we also do nutrition. So uh, I'm still figuring out what I'm going to do, but I know that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this right now. And uh, but I know that no matter where I go, uh, I have this outside the box thinking and this integrative like mindset. And I know that whatever I decide to do moving forward, uh, I'm going to bring all those skills uh, to make the world a better place. So I just want to say thank you to Wagner and thank you all for being here. And thank you very much. Fantastic. We have Carolina Silva. Now, Carolina, I've known since she was a first year student. I think I met you in my house as a first year student. We had some reception for our students. Now she's a trustee of the college. Um, this is interesting. I feel ancient at the moment. <laughs> no, she's a fast riser. And Carolyn, come up, please. She, her, please come up and, and give us your story. It's, a, it's quite a tale. Um, so I'm here to talk about the power of humanities in the corporate world. And what I really want to emphasize here is that when you understand humanities, you understand humans. When you understand humanities, you understand humans. And the, the number one thing that you have to manage when you join the corporate world is people. Corporate America consists of power politics and the dynamics of people. And I'm here to tell you a little bit about my story. So my name is uh, Carolina Silva. I am the daughter of Colombian immigrants. I grew up in South Florida. I was the first American born of my household. And I came to Wagner College on a division one water polo scholarship. And what I chose to study when I got to Wagner was I chose international affairs with a concentration in politics and a minor in economics and German. And what I'll tell you is coming from a family of engineers, if there's any first gen kids here from a third world country background, you might have also been raised with the mentality that if you're not a doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer, you're nothing. <laughs> and so my dad, for the life of him, could not understand what I was going to do with my life studying international affairs with a concentration in politics and a minor in economics in German. He would always ask me every single time when I was at Wagner, every single time we had the opportunity to have a conversation, he's just like, I just don't understand how you're gonna make a living. How is that applied? How can that be applied to anything? How are you gonna make money? 
And for me, being uh, coming from an immigrant household and, and speaking so many different languages, growing up speaking Spanish, Portuguese, German, um, I inevitably had a global perspective. And so for me, I was interested in learning about the interconnectivity of the world, learning about history, politics, economics, language, and culture. And so for the students that are in the room, the best advice that I can give you is study what you want to study. Study what you want to study because at least you'll enjoy it. You'll enjoy the time and it doesn't feel like work. And so for me, what the Wagner Plan did for me is, is truly the aspect of the experiential learning. Right? I remember taking a class, the history of New York City. Um, I remember uh, my ILC, well, the history of New York City. We had New York City in our backyard, so we could actually learn real time some of the things that were in the textbook. Um, my ILC, studying uh, literature and art, what did we do? We would go to the Met and we would learn about these artists and see the paintings in real time of what we were learning in a textbook. And so what the Wagner Plan did for me is that it allowed me to be curious and learn outside of my comfort zone. I remember taking a film photography my senior year um, just for fun, right? So what the Wagner Plan did for me was it allowed me to be curious and it allowed me to learn outside of my comfort zone. And this is transferable to whatever it is that you do in your life. Being curious and learning something new is always transferable. Now, what I want everyone, all the students in this room to know is don't let what you major in define what you do with your life. Don't let what you major in define what you do with your life and what you study does not define your success. What you study does not define your success. Now, fast forward to my junior year at Wagner College, I got exposed to the Women's Professional Network, and this was the opportunity for me to meet a bunch of Wagner alumni um, working in business, and some of them happen to be um, my fellow Board of Trustees um, that, that I serve with today. And I realized by seeing these women, they were just so powerful, they looked so successful. I didn't know what they did, but I was just like, I want to be like them, and I, I decided I wanted to work in finance. Mind you, I'd never taken a single business course at Wagner. I'd never taken a finance course before at Wagner. Um, and the one thing I'll tell you about Wall Street is that it loves to challenge you. And by challenge you, I mean it likes to reject you. <laughs> and so experien experiential learning at its finest, I got an internship working in finance. And what did I do? I would take the shuttle. I would take the ferry. I would take the subway all the way up to Midtown Manhattan and back at my first finance internship and I took one of my water polo teammates finance textbooks. And again, experiential learning. I was learning on the job what stocks and bonds were and I was learning in a textbook what stocks and bonds were. And what I would say is when, once I got into financial services, I had this aha moment of, oh, everything is connected. <laughs> when I think about uh, the engineers in my family, I look at my dad and my brother, they like to think about everything and they wanna break everything down. They wanna understand how everything works, but the education that I had, rather than having a micro perspective, I had a macro perspective. I had an understanding that we live in a capitalist society in economics, political science, languages, it gives you that macro view rather than the micro view. Now, once I did get my foot in the door working in wealth management, I realized the importance of always being curious and knowing, always knowing a little bit about everything. I, sh I said this earlier, you know, the study of humanities, cultures, arts, language, history, and theater, when you understand humanities, you understand humans, when you understand humans, you can build relationships, and building relationships with people will always be relevant, no matter what you do. So if we think about humanities as the soul of the human experience, when you understand a language, you understand a culture, when you understand society, you understand that we live in a capitalistic society, and the beauty about capitalism is that there's a value in a market for almost anything. <laughs> and you know, working in wealth management, I can see that wealthy people, they like to invest in art as an asset class. They wanna be producers of films and theater. Um, and one of the reasons why I think I've been so successful in my career is because I understand people. I can, I can connect with clients that come from completely socio, it's completely different socioeconomic uh, classes for me from different generations than me. And what I really think it comes down to is that when you understand people, you understand their passions, you understand their cultures, you understand their experiences, their greatest fears, what motivates them, what they're trying to accomplish, that builds trust. Being able to understand people builds that trust and connectivity. And, and I'll tell 
you all that, you know, I've been, despite not having a business major, despite not studying finance, I've been a financial advisor for seven years now since my time at Wagner. And a fun fact about my industry is that there's actually an 80% failure rate of financial advisors in their first year in the business. Over an 80% failure rate of financial advisors in the business. And so for somebody to make it this far, seven years in, less than 1% of people make it this far. I'm still striving to get into the 0.001%. <laughs> um, I'm a capitalist. Um, and so my profession is being in the business of people. And one of the things that I've seen, right, I've seen so many people fail in this business in my time. I would see so many finance majors that they would just go so deep into the weeds. Like the engineers in my family, they wanted to understand how everything works, that they lose sight of the most important aspect of the business, which is understanding the people. And I remember interviewing for my first uh, internship working in wealth management when I was a Wagner student. And the only reason why I got the interview is because I told the career, um, the career office that I really wanted to break into finance. I told anybody who would listen to me, I want to break into finance, even though I didn't know what that actually meant. And so I sat and um, interviewed against other finance majors. And despite them taking all of their finance classes, they didn't land the internship. They didn't get the job. So people don't care about how much you know until they know how much you care. And part of caring about people is knowing what they care about most and understanding what they care about most. Clients have hobbies. They like art, they like theater, they like history, they like culture, they like to travel, right? So just keeping that in mind that all of the things that you're studying, all of the interdisciplinary education, it just gives you exposure to being able to talk about something that's different, something that's not, outside, not in your typical day to day. So the key things that I want the students in the room to remember, number one, be curious. Be curious, always be learning. Take courses that you find interesting. Number two, what you study does not define your success. What you study does not define your success. And the last thing is that when you understand humanities, you understand humans, when you understand humans, you build relationships and building relationships is always going to be relevant in your life. Thank you. so much. Our next speaker is Kelly Griffith. She, her, I know Kelly said she was a freshman. Oh my goodness. And she is a dynamic teacher. So Kelly, we we'll throw it to you. Hi everybody. My name is Kelly Griffith Tanaka now. I did add a second last name since I graduated. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, here's my, uh, my artsy little name. So how the small liberal arts school on the hill inspired me to travel the world and cumplir mis sueños. If you don't know, that means achieve my dreams. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how I ended up here today and my experience at Wagner. But I also want to mention something. Carolina was just talking to us about building relationships. And I met my best, best, best friends at Wagner. Um, some of them right in my first year learning community. And uh, that's something that gives me chills and makes me excited to come back to campus and um, have all of those memories come flooding back, and as I was looking at pictures too, um, I wouldn't be who I was, who I am today, without those friendships and without the Wagner plan. So you're gonna hear a little bit how that all came together. Okay. So, um, I found myself at Wagner College after a stressful college search. Um, for the students in the, in the room, that might be a, an active memory for you. It was pretty stressful for me, as I had no idea where I wanted to go. Um, or what was the right choice to make. So from my small hometown of Riverhead on Eastern Long Island, um, I still remember falling on the floor in my kitchen after Jake Brown from admissions called me and told me I was accepted and they were offering me a scholarship. <laughs> the idea of studying at Wagner that I had barely seen just through pamphlets and the, of the beautiful pictures and I remember the Wagner plan right in the centerfold. Um, it felt like a dream. And I knew even as a high school student, I had to do two things. The first, I wanted to be fluent in Spanish, and the second, I wanted to teach. I didn't know how the journey would take shape, but it started here at Wagner in LC8, best LC ever, um, <laughs> with Dr. Sanchez, Margarita Sanchez, and Sarah Donovan. Um, we were required to complete our civic engagement hours at El Centro del Inmigrante in Port Richmond, um, and we took a Spanish and philosophy course and connected those together. I remember working alongside my peers and 
Um, even though some of my peers, well, all of my peers came from all over the country and as we were teaching English to adults and children, a lot of times we would laugh at our accents. My friends that grew up in the South were teaching words in way different ways and pronunciation in way different ways than my Long Island roots were. But we made it through um, and little by little, I fell in love with Port Richmond. Um, I fell in love with the people, the community, the restaurants, the food I could get from the restaurants, which I still think are the best on Staten Island, and the way that it would help me achieve those dreams, right? Be able to teach and be fluent in Spanish. I wrapped up my first semester at Wagner with a trip to Ecuador with Habitat for Humanity. All oh, my pictures are not come, all coming through, but that one in the top right, here we go. Um, so that's my trip to Ecuador with Habitat for Humanity. That was um, right at the completion of my first semester at Wagner. And some of my classmates from LC8 actually joined me on that trip. Uh, my sophomore year, I was named Port Richmond Scholar of Education, which allowed me to spend more time in the schools in the community, supporting the adult and young learners, um, as well as the teachers in the dual language programs. I learned about dual language programs and I'm currently a dual language teacher, so it started right here in Port Richmond. I completed my intermediate learning and education and uh, my junior year, and then that led me to Costa Rica. My pictures aren't there, but it was an unforgettable experience, an unforgettable summer. Um, I volunteered at an early childhood center, again, building towards that dream of teaching and becoming fluent in Spanish. And I lived with a host family that actually just last summer came to my wedding in Costa Rica. So they, again, building relationships and connecting with people all over the world, truly. Going into my senior year at Wagner, I remember a conversation I had with Margarita Sanchez. I had just come home from Costa Rica and one single year stood between me and this dream, right? One more year of classes and I'm gonna get a job as a teacher and I'm, I'm gonna be fluent in Spanish. And I sat in Margarita's office and I said, I can't do it. Um, I needed to go back to Latin America. I, if Wagner taught me one thing through the Wagner plan, it was that there was so much more for me to explore, more for me to learn, more for me to know, and more for me to do. There was no way I could stand in front of a class of young students and tell them I was ready. There were countless small communities that I could learn from and be a small part of. And Margarita told me in her small office in Parker Hall, she said, vete, 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 go, go, go. So on a whim, actually, I applied to be a Fulbright English teaching assistant, completely unaware of the prestige that Fulbright as a name <laughs> held. I had no idea. Um, and on April 1st, I was at this point my senior year working on my senior uh, learning community with Margarita Sanchez, writing my essay completely in Spanish, my thesis completely in Spanish. It was April 1st, um, and I got an email that I was accepted to be the Fulbright English teaching assistant uh, in Ecuador. I was Fulbright, Wagner's first Fulbright in a little while, and and I really thought it was an April Fool's joke, for real. And then Dr. G sent flowers to my dorm room, and I said, okay, I think this is real. <laughs> in Ecuador, I co-taught English classes. My students are in the bottom right there. Um, those are aspiring teachers that I worked with at the University of Loja, which is a small city in the south of Ecuador, nestled in the Andes Mountains. I also worked with, uh, at, I volunteered at the Early Childhood Center, which you can see on the top right there. Um, I was completely culture shocked, but also headstrong and determined to achieve my dreams. I lived in a studio apartment by myself. I got the opportunity also to travel to Peru and Mexico. and. Eventualmente cumplí mis sueños. I eventually did achieve my dreams. I taught and I learned Spanish to fluency. So since 2015, when I returned from Ecuador, um, I've been working as an early childhood bilingual teacher in Spanish English dual language programs. So my students are 50% native Spanish speakers in an ideal world, 50% native Spanish speakers and 50% native English speakers. So children serve as language models for each other. Um, the, the instruction is completely split up, 50% in Spanish and 50% in English. Um, I've taught in first grade and kindergarten, so early childhood is my, is my spot there, my sweet spot. Um, I taught in Port Richmond for five years. Before the pandemic moved me to Jackson Heights, Queens, which is a lovely, um, extremely vibrant and immigrant rich community, which I'm really happy at now. I teach, I still teach kindergarten there and I live there. Uh, and I also work with graduate students at the city, at the city college of New York. It's a CUNY school. Um, and I work with aspiring educators in their graduate program. So what do I do? I teach kindness. I teach friends how to tie their shoes. 
I teach them how to walk in the line in the hallway, all 25 of them. It's a difficult task. Um, I teach them reading and writing and math and Spanish and English. I teach my culture responsive. I teach my, my graduate students about culture responsive pedagogy and translanguaging and everything that it means to be a teacher in 2023 in this post-COVID or however you want to call it world. But overwhelmingly so, I try to teach my students my youngest is four and a half and my oldest is 64. Um, I try to teach them about the vastness and the beauty of our world and our own smaller communities and the importance of connecting to both, which is something that I learned through the Wagner Plan. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Sharon. Each one of these is so remarkable, isn't it? It's just amazing, inspiring. Remy Van Pola, or Colin? I'm Colin, hey then, uh, he's going to talk about building community through the arts. Hello everyone. Hello. Hi, so full disclosure, um, I was asked to come present here this morning um, <laughs> to fill in for my wonderful friend and colleague, Joey Donnelly. Um, so I do not unfortunately have a presentation for you, but I will talk my heart out about just how much the Wagner Plan and just Wagner College in general has meant to me in my life and my career and in my community. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with the musical theater college audition process. Uh, if you aren't, it is a nightmare and I would not wish it on my worst enemy, but it is a very interesting way to find yourself in a program that for so many people ends up being the right place. I was fortunate enough at the end of my process to have a few different options um, between BFAs, BAs, bachelors in music. And one thing I was really, really looking for was a school that would give me the opportunity to not just be an actor and acting would be the only thing I studied all day every day. I wanted a place where I could study other elements of theater. I wanted a place where I could study anthropology and psychology and physics and math and looking at the Wagner College Wagner plan I was like oh this is perfect. So I chose Wagner and four years later there I was graduating. So one of the big things that a lot of people come into Wagner or any college experience thinking about is, oh God, how am I going to make friends? How am I going to meet anyone? Uh, what are we going to talk about? And I'll come back to that question in a second because I was lucky enough to be placed in LC18 with Dr. Ruff and Professor Toth mm -hmm. um, doing wonderful, wonderful work in script analysis and making and seeing art in New York. Our theme was, or, or the class title, I believe, for the first year learning community was Bon Appetit from Cucumber Sandwiches to Cannibalism. So it was all about food in art and theater, which was incredible. They had never done it before, and they'll never do it again. <laughs> um, but it was a wonderful, wonderful time. Um, and so the question, of course, comes up again. We're meeting all these people during orientation. You're taking these classes with them. You're like, oh, God, what are we going to talk about? How about you go hang out in someone's room and talk about how Shakespeare's Titus Andronicus is kind of camp? Why don't you spend five hours in Parker Hall making a music, uh, mosaic with each other? I mean, that's our, those are real things that we did. I don't know where those mosaics are, but I'd love to see them again. Um, there, so I found myself suddenly with a group of people undergoing the same wonderful, strange, incredible journey with me. And we had loads to talk about. And suddenly I had a group of like 25 best friends my first semester in college many of whom I'm still incredibly close with to this day. Um, they're very impactful to me and they are my community. They are artists that I have collaborated with in my own theater work. They have been my lighting and scenic designers for shows that I've been in. They've been actors in shows that I've directed and written. They have been friends in the audience cheering me on while I was doing my work. And that became so important to me. And the other portion is that we as a learning community gave back to our community here on Staten Island. A big portion of our work was working with the Wagner College Food Recovery Network, um, working to supply food to um, the people in need on Staten Island who did not have access consistently to nutritious food. Uh, so that was a big part. So we felt much more enriched in the community. Now the big portion of this learning community, as it was an experiential learning community, was going out into New York to pretty much every museum you could imagine to experience art and then come back and make our own just as good versions of it. <laughs> um, 
but it was very exciting. That is how I learned how to navigate New York, was we would be in our RFT, and uh, Jenny would stand up at the whiteboard and be like, all right, here's what you're going to do. You're going to get to the ferry. This is a Dairy Queen opportunity. And then you're going to go hop on the 4-5, and then you're going to get to the Brooklyn Museum, you're going to go to the third floor, and you're going to see Judy Chicago's dinner table, um, which was an incredible piece of art, if any of you have not seen it. Um, and so we were getting to experience all of these incredible artists' work and then come back and react to it. This LC more than anything between both making and seeing art in New York and script analysis and all of our discussions about these plays taught me how not to be a passive observer of art, but really to be an active participant in art, um, which moved my dial over from being a single-minded performer to a director and playwright and choreographer, very interested in all sides of the table of theater and art. So I'm very, very thankful for all the people and community I built in that LC. My intermediate learning community was also along the lines of the arts. I was in uh, Dr. Urbank and Dr. Morowitz's uh, intermediate learning community, Cities and Perversities, uh, Art History and Literature, and Turn of the Century Paris, Vienna, and Berlin, and where else but Wagner are you going to take a class like that? <laughs> um, it was so, so thrilling to get the chance to take a peek into this really specific period in art history and see, like, whoa, so much has changed, but also, has it? Also, aren't we still feeling these same things today, and can't we find the same way to react to it? How do we bring this past to the present, and how do we interact with it now? Which was really exciting. Then my senior learning community, as all theater performance majors have, uh, was my uh, senior showcase. Now, unfortunately, uh, I graduated in 2021, uh, in the middle of the pandemic, so our senior showcase was not uh, quite the grand affair it normally is. However, the theater department did everything possible that they could to support us and make us know that we were still as valuable to this school as every other class to come before us and every class will come after us, um, including allowing us to have a great number of workshops with current industry professionals, which is actually how I got my job that I currently have. I work as a teaching artist with Paper Mill Playhouse. I work in their theater education department, um, both within their year-round theater school summer programs, as well as their adopt-a-school program, wherein I go to uh, less fortunate schools within the New Jersey and New York greater area and teach theater to them. We help them devise theater. We help them learn musicals. We help them do pretty much anything so that they get to experience the arts, not just as passive observers, but as active participants, just like I did. And I have my senior learning community thank because I was introduced to my the person who hired me through that um, learning community, which has just, just been such a wonderful time. So if I haven't expressed just how deeply Wagner has changed my life and how much I love Wagner, uh, let me leave you on this final thought. I am currently working here as a director and playwright. <laughs> Over in stage one, where you can come see a workshop production of my play, Daughters of Leda, opening in two weeks. So please come by. Thank you all so much. Comment or two. I know it's going to get it's getting late. We can comment or two from the audience. Questions. There's so many people in the audience who are so much a part of the building of this program over the years, in leadership positions, in teaching positions alike. There's new people, new students are here. There's lots of staff, so um, it's a chance to kind of reflect. But I, I would just say, again, to reiterate, when you look at these four fabulous alums and you think these are the people we want in the professions that shape the world around us, each one of you are just fabulous. And this is what, we, this, is what this whole point was. You know, we came here, we were built, 1918 was it, as a Lutheran liberal arts college. It was always a uh, fairly inclusive kind of Lutheranism. I'm not religious, so I can say this as an outsider. And it, it, was, it was a place that wanted to make a difference and wanted to build an education that was broad and deeper and, and for social good. And I think we've not drifted that much away at, at all. I think we've reified that in many ways, that mission. And you can see it in all four of your stories. So I can't thank you enough. So let's, if there's a question or coming, I know there are people in the audience who may want to add some things that we left out. There's a million people to thank. I know there's a reception over in the atrium. Yes. Uh, so we can go there in a second or two. But anyone want to make a comment in any way, shape, or form? Or question? Or? Okay, let's go have some but fun. But thank you, thank you, Richard, for all you did in starting this wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. It's hard to accept comments, but thank you very much. But I wanted to 
this, and this is critical for this faculty now, it was the faculty creativity that built the plan. Okay, we built the architecture together, but what I've taught the plan myself for two years, so I know what goes into it, a tremendous amount of work that goes into this. But now you have to think about what students need now in a world that's so divisive, so threatened, so challenging, uh, a world that needs people like this to lead organizations. And I mean, when I mean lead, I don't necessarily mean run from the top. Leadership is not hierarchical. It's, it's horizontal. It's bringing the best out of people, building teams, and getting the best out of those teams. That's what it is. And Caroline, I think you could your whole testimony was about that, that notion. So thank you again, Margarita, for organizing this. Can I throw this back to you so you can say the last yeah. word? Yes. <laughs> happy that we really had this wonderful participation. I mean, we learned about so many different things representing humanities, professional programs. It was really amazing to have. And thank you, Richard. Thank you for coming back to us. We miss you. And uh, thank you all. Uh, we had the reception at 6.30 in the atrium. And then you can also go and see the exhibit that has been put uh, together by Sarah Scott, with Jenny Scott, Jenny and Matt, Kobe, Matt is Matt. not here with us, but he also Matt. helped. Yep. So thank you all for coming. Uh, it was important to see all of my colleagues and the staff members, the wonderful staff members, and the students, of course. Thank you for coming. Hey.